Hello, everyone. We are live and recording. My name is Kelly Ann. I'm a bookseller with Mysterious Galaxy, and tonight I have the pleasure of introducing Barry Liga. Barry, did I say your last name correctly? You did. Okay, cool. <laughs> I meant to ask before, but I'm glad I got it correct on the first try. Um, so we have Barry Liga tonight. You might recognize him as the author of the I Hunt Killer series and multiple other middle grade reader books and YA titles including middle grade adaptations of DC's The Flash, which includes the book that he's here to discuss tonight. Tomorrow it is released. It's The Flash, Legends of Forever, which officially comes out tomorrow. Happy early book birthday. Um, this is the third and final book in his series, The Flash Crossover Crisis Trilogy. So before we get started, we'll just do a little intro housekeeping for anyone who hasn't used Crowdcast. There is a lovely chat section on the right, which you're welcome to say your hellos to our author. Um, there's a wonderful buy books and signed book plates button right below our video in green. That'll take you directly to Mysterious Galaxy where you can purchase Barry's book. And below that button, there's the lovely ask a question. Uh, if you click that, you can ask our author any question that you want and start just typing your questions in there and then we'll answer them at the end of the event. And with that, I'm just going to hop off and let Barry do his thing. Have a great event. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, for some reason, I am, I am looking and uh, I'm supposed to be able to share my screen, but for some reason that feature is not working for me. Um, which is very strange. Uh, so I'm not going to be able to share my screen and show you a couple of the things that I wanted to show you. Um, so I'll just talk about them instead, and uh, I'll talk for a little bit, and then uh, hopefully we will have questions. Please, please, if you have questions, put them either in the chat or, or uh, click on Ask a Question down below so that uh, I'm not just sitting here twiddling my thumbs and, uh, and, and hoping that people have questions. Um, so yes, this is Flash Crossover Crisis, The Legends of Forever. Um, this, is, this is the third and final book in the Crossover Crisis trilogy, but it is the sixth and final book in, in the, the Flash Hexology, I guess we'd call it, six books, a, a hexology, um, that, uh, that began back in 2016 with The Flash Hocus Pocus which was the, the first book that started all of this. And at the time, uh, I got a phone call from uh, Andrew Smith, who is in charge at, at Abrams. And he said, hey, we just, uh, we just got the rights to do novels based on the Flash TV show. And I immediately said, oh my God, yes, yes, I'm in, I'm in. How much do I have to pay you? Um, and he said, no, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll pay you. Don't worry. Uh, and... And this was the beginning of, of a really wonderful uh, experience for me because I have been a fan of The Flash pretty much my whole life. Um, I even have, I have the ring. Uh, you can see it even opens. Uh, I, I keep hoping when I open it that the costume is going to pop out like in the comics. Um, but it has not happened yet. But that doesn't stop me from trying. I, I, I keep trying. But nothing yet. It'll happen someday. Uh, I've been a fan uh, of The Flash, like I said, uh, mo most of my life. You know, when I was a, a kid growing up with the name Barry, there were not a lot of really cool people named Barry that you could, uh, that you could look up to. Um, there was Barry White, a uh, great singer, but obviously, even as a child, I knew that I would never be as smooth and as cool as Barry White. Um, and uh, other than that, there's... Barry Manilow, I mean, you know, the, the guy's got a good singing voice, but just not particularly cool. Um, but then I read these comics, and there was this guy, Barry Allen, and he was the Flash. And he had one power, and it was really simple. He could run really, really fast. And to me, that's just a, a glorious, glorious power to have. Um, you know, the, the ability to move so quickly, uh, it just... It changes everything about the world. And one of the things I, I loved about The Flash, too, the, the comics, they were steeped in science. They were all about science. The, the people who created The Flash, the people who wrote and drew The Flash, were 
came came out of the the great science fiction traditions of the 1950s and 60s and so they tried to put interesting science fiction and science elements into the comics and i really responded to that as a kid because i i really enjoyed science so i really loved the character and and i got this offer this this opportunity to write the character and I, I just, I had to jump on it immediately. And, and I did, and I was really pleased and, and happy that I got to do this. Um, and so I wrote the first three books, uh, Hocus Pocus, Johnny Quick, and The Tornado Twins. And, uh, and I felt like it was, it was a nice little story that, that worked, that was held together nicely. And there were bits in each book that, that I put in there just for myself. And the, uh, the, the, the thing that was interesting was I, I sort of left a little bit of things open. That, that's a, a thing that writers do a lot. When Even when we know it's the end of the story, you always leave a little something open just in case you want to come back to it someday. And in this case, what happened was I, I finished the third book and I thought, well, this, this was a lot of fun and, and this scratched a lot of itches and, and this was terrific. Um, but, uh, but, you know, just in case, I'm going to leave this open. And then I got another phone call from Andrew Smith saying, hey, um, the people at, at Warner Brothers, the people at the CW who run the TV show, really like what you did. And, uh, and they would like you to do more. They would like you to do another trilogy, this time using all the characters from the CW shows. So Supergirl, Green Arrow, Legends of Tomorrow. That was it at the time. There were, Batwoman wasn't on the air yet. Uh, Superman and Lois wasn't on the air yet, although I, I did use Superman. Um, Black Lightning wasn't on the air yet. So they, at the time, it was those other three shows, and they wanted me to, to do this big crossover. And again, I said, how much do I have to pay you to do this? I would love to do this. And uh, and again, they, they promised to pay me instead. And I went ahead and, and I did it. And it has just been so much fun getting to play on this huge canvas um, the, the premise of the books, for those of you who are, are into the TV shows, at the end of season two of The Flash, Barry runs back in time and changes history uh, into something called Flashpoint, which causes all sorts of problems. And the premise in the books is that this is an alternate timeline where he didn't do that. He never went back in time and changed history. And so what would that world have been like if it had just continued going forward? Uh, which means that I sort of have my own version of the Arrowverse to play with. I call it the Barryverse. <laughs> um, and it, I just get my own version of it. And it's wonderful because I can just have fun with it and not worry about, am I contradicting something on the show? Is the show contradicting something in the books? I can just go ahead and, and have fun with it. And that's what I've been doing uh, for, for five years now. And and now this is the end. And it's sort of, it's sort of bittersweet. Um, Again, these six books all build to this final conclusion, and I feel like it really works. Um, and, and that's a tremendously satisfying thing. At the same time, I love doing this, and I've had so much fun with it. Uh, so if you were to ask me, well, before you said that a lot of times writers will leave something open just in case so that they can come back to a story later. And if you ask me that I do that in here, um, I would say, you read the book and you tell me. Um, I think it's pretty obvious, though. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read just a little bit, just a few pages, um, just to give you a little taste of the story. Um, and this is right from the beginning, so there's no spoilers or anything like that. Um, basically, uh, at the end of the previous book, um, Supergirl's Sacrifice, um, Flash and Supergirl and Superman and Green Arrow and Martian Manhunter um, have defeated Antimatter Man who is the, the villain of the first two books, and they think he's the big bad, but he's not. There's something worse. Um, and Barry and Green Arrow are on Earth-38, and they have to get back to Earth-1 to continue the fight, and Superman is going to come with them. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the crisis on Infinite Earths that happened on the TV show did not happen in this timeline, so they're still on Earth-38 with Supergirl and Superman, and the, the Earths are still all separate. So... Ever made the multiverse transit before? Barry asked the Man of Steel. Superman tilted his head this way and that, as they're not entirely sure how to answer the question. I've been places, he said. They stood atop the DEO building in National City. Brainiac 5 had reverse-engineered the transmatter device Cisco Ramon had invented so that it could project a large enough breach for the Flash, Green Arrow, and Superman to travel to Earth-1. 
At the same time, Brainy said, I believe I may be able to use this technology to begin closing breaches from other Earths to Earth-38. He paused. But this is only theoretical at this time. And we still need to identify the strays from other Earths, Alex Danvers put in, and track down the people from Earth-38 who've ended up on other Earths, John added. Gathered on the roof, the team exchanged a group look of exhaustion. Our best bet, Superman told them with a sunny confidence that seemed both out of place yet wholly earned, is to track down the villain behind this and stop him. Or her, Alex said, fuming. Women can be world-conquering, time-traveling, universe-destroying menaces too, you know. Superman nodded. Point well taken. I apologize. Once we confront and stop him, or her, the quantum breaches should halt. Then we'll have a finite number of multiversal refugees to locate and return. Superman nodded. Point well, oops, sorry, <laughs> missed that. Assuming we can identify all of them and figure out where they're supposed to be, Oliver said somewhat dourly, it's a big complicated multiverse out there. There were, as far as they knew, 54 universes, the 52 universes of the known multiverse, plus the rogue Nazi universe of Earth X, all 53 of which were composed of positive matter. The 54th was the Antiverse, the antimatter universe, including Quard, the world where antimatter man had been created. So far, no breaches had opened to or from that hellish place. But if they did, the current crisis, crisis would worsen beyond imagining. When positive matter and antimatter came into contact, they destroyed each other, causing a cascading toxic chain reaction that had wiped out Earth-27 and almost eradicated all life on Earth-38 as well. With breaches opening at random between the 53 positive matter universes, it was, as Green Arrow had indicated, nearly impossible to track who had come from or gone to which universe. Superman smiled. I have every confidence we'll figure it out, Green Arrow. Your optimism is appreciated, if not entirely founded in logic, Brainy said. He grimaced for a moment at the tablet he held. There is considerable interference at the quark level. No doubt a side effect of our unnamed foe opening so many breaches at once. The fabric between universes was never intended to suffer so many tears. He paused and looked up at them all. You understand I'm using the word fabric metaphorically. There is no actual, we get it, Brainy. Barry Allen, the Flash, bounced on the balls of his feet in mingled eagerness and frustration. Every second they wasted on Earth-38 was another second that his archenemy, Eobard Thawne, the reverse Flash, spent at the end of time, using his speed to power the machinery that their mysterious foe used to wreak havoc on the present. Barry knew that they needed to get back to Earth-1 and use the Time Bureau's technology to head to the end of time and end this once and for all. I just wanted to avoid any unnecessary confusion, Brady sniffed. Now, due to the recurring breaches, there is a slight chance that you may experience some limited chronal realignment during transit. Superman's eyebrow arched as though to say, Oh, do tell. Limited chronal realignment, Oliver said. What's that? Time travel, Barry said with a slight shiver. Come on, Brainy. Very, very limited, Brainy promised. No more than a day, I promise. Scout's honor, Barry asked. I assume you refer to the oath of the Pangalactic Scouts of Zoom, the most holy oath in the galaxy. Yes, Scout's honor. A day at most, Oliver snorted. Big deal, been there, done that. That's the spirit, Oliver, Barry said, clapping him on the back. We'll make you a mad scientist yet. So, again, that's just a little bit of the book. As they prepare to return to Earth-1, they think things are going to be easy. Things are not going to be easy. There's a lot more book to go after that. Um, I'm actually going to dive in here and take a look at some questions um, just to see what we've got. Uh, oh, we have some excellent questions here. Uh, if you were a superhero, what would your superhero name be and what would be your superpower? Um, you know, it's tough when you just have to pick one power because so many of them work really well together. Um, but if I had to pick one superpower, it would probably be super speed, like the Flash. Um, I would probably want to call myself the Flash, but I would probably get sued by DC Comics if I did that. So um, the problem is most of the speedster names are, are taken. You, know, you got your, your Flash and your Kid Flash. Uh, you got your Quicksilver and Max Mercury and your Johnny Quick and Jesse Quick. Uh, maybe I'll be Barry Quick. No, that's not good. Um, I, I, 
I, I don't know what my superhero name would be. I mean, you know, there's all the speed streams are taken. I would probably just be something. I'd probably just have to go something like, you know, fast dude. Uh, somebody in the chat just said Barry Quick is awesome. I like that. You win. I will be Barry Quick. That is my that is my superhero name. Um, I will be Barry Quick, and I will have little lightning bolts all over myself. Uh, so let's look at another question here. Um, would you rather be able to write slash finish books as fast as the Flash can run? or edit your books as fast as the flash can run. Oh, man. Um, that is a tough one. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, the thing is, I'm actually a pretty fast writer already. Um, so I'm going to say edit, because I actually, I don't enjoy the editing process. I don't enjoy the revision process. Um, when, I, when I write a book, I get this great feeling that I've achieved something. Um, I, I go into writing a book because I wonder to myself, can I do it? Can I tell this story? I have this idea for a story. Can I tell it and will it work? Will it all come together? And, and when I finish that first draft, I have my answer. Yes, I can write it. I can tell that story. It does work. Everything after that is, is this, this process of figuring out how to how to take this thing that works for me personally and make it something that more people will enjoy. And, uh, and, and that's, that's not as pleasant or as fun. That, that, that's the part that feels like work. So I think I would love to be able to edit very quickly because then I would write the book and that's fun. And then I would edit quickly and then just move on to the next book. And that would be, that would be great. So that's my answer there. Uh, next question. What was the most rewarding part of writing this series? Whew. Um, you know, I think, I think the most rewarding part, and, then, and I was going to show you guys some, some pictures of this, but I can't. Uh, but I think the most rewarding part for me was being able to put in these little references, these little in-jokes, these little Easter eggs, these fun things that if you're a big-time comic book nerd like I am, you would see them and understand them and, and come to enjoy them and, and get a chuckle out of it or, or even just say, I know who that guy is. Um, and, and if you aren't a huge big time comic book nerd like me, you, you won't feel like you're missing anything. There were a lot of things like that in there that I did and they were a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, each book had, had different things in it that I was really, I was really pleased with. Um, in, in the first book, in Hocus Pocus, I, I put in a joke about Jennifer Lopez's butt. And I kind of can't believe they let me do that. <laughs> um, and then uh, in the second book, I, I, I did a nice, a nice swerve that I don't think anybody saw coming. And I won't bring it up in case you haven't read the book. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. But I was, the, the, the identity of the villain, I think everybody kind of thought they knew what it was going to be. And then it wasn't. Um, but also in that book, I, I brought in a character, the Phantom Stranger, who was a cool comic book character I really loved as a kid, and I, I used him just for just for a moment in in the second book. Um, in the third book, in the Tornado Twins, definitely the thing I am proudest of, um, and I wish I could show you guys this, but uh, uh, in the Tornado Twins, Barry is is being forced to stand still by the by the villain. He's forced to stand in this one spot and the villain shoots a beam of light at him and, um, and Barry quickly spins around so fast that, that he creates this friction heat that bends the beam of light and sends it back at the villain. And he says, didn't anybody ever tell you that heat bends light? And that is actually a direct line from an old episode of the super friends that I watched when I was a kid, um, back in 1978. And I remembered it all these years. And I just love that moment on the cartoon. And I love that line. And so I just grabbed it and I just put it in the book. And I was really, really proud of that. Uh, so e each book had these, these different things. Uh, you know, in, in, in Crossover Crisis, I got to use Ambush Bug, who is a character from my childhood. Um, this goofy sort of guy who knows he's living in a comic book. Um, so my version knows he's living in a novel written by me. So he's always making comments about the novel. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. I didn't think I would get to use him. Um, each book had these things in it. But overall, over the six books, I think the best thing was just being able to just let my imagination run wild and just do 
crazy, crazy things to these characters and with these characters that I never thought um, I would get to do. And it just, it made me so happy to do this. Um, you know, again, I've loved these characters since I was a kid. And to get to play with them and to do things and put words in their mouth, to put words in Superman's mouth, to put words in the Flash's mouth, Supergirl, Brainiac 5, all these characters. It was so much fun and such a pleasure. Um, and, and I never thought I would write one book with these characters, much less six. And, and that was really, that was really wonderful. Next question. How did writing within the constraints of an existing canon, whether the CW show or the original comics, change how you approach the idea for this trilogy? Um, I will tell you a secret. <laughs> um, originally, this series was not supposed to be set in a separate timeline from the TV series. Originally, it was supposed to be set in the exact same timeline as the TV series. And what happened was, as I was writing the first book, and they were and they were producing the show, you know, I was trying to keep up with them, but they have new episodes coming out every week, and I have one book coming out every year. And we realized that it was going to be impossible to keep up. And that was when uh, somebody, when when my editor suggested, well, what if we say this is a separate timeline, and then that way you don't have to worry about keeping up with the TV show. And uh, I thought that was a great suggestion. And like I said, it gave me my own version of the DC universe to play with, where I didn't have to worry about messing them up or them messing me up. I could just tell my story and, and they could tell their story and everything was great and everybody was happy. Um, so the, the hardest part was it was initially trying to, to keep, keep up with them. And, uh, and then that went away. So other than that, really the, the hardest part was trying to bring in all these things that I love about the characters, but at the same time, keep it accessible to readers who don't happen to happen to be, you know, guys who've been reading comics for 40 years. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't want people to have to run to Wikipedia every, every three pages to figure out what was going on or who was this guy, who was that guy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I didn't want that to be the case. And as a result, I had to really try to focus and, and keep things as simple as I could while still making the story complicated enough to be interesting. Uh, you know, somebody just said in the chat, uh, the multiple timelines always seem complicated, but I can see how it would be nice when writing concurrent stories. And yeah, that, that's the case. You, you've got to balance these things. You've got to balance the, the needs of the reader and the needs of the story. And uh, I tried to keep, like I said, I tried to keep the, the, the nature of the timelines as simple as possible. I tried to explain it multiple times in different ways so that people would definitely get it. I tried to make sure that in each book, I referred to it in some way that would make sense for people so that they wouldn't get confused, they wouldn't get frustrated. Um, and as far as uh, you know, the canon of the comics, I mean, that, that, was, that was the joy. Once I was sort of liberated from the constraints of trying to keep up with the weekly continuity of the TV show, I realized I had 80 years of comic book continuity that I could play with. And so I started to bring in characters like the Crime Syndicate of America, the Phantom Stranger, Madame Xanadu, um, Ambush Bug, all these other characters that I could, that I could have fun with. And, uh, and in fact, I decided that every character that we meet in the books who speaks would be a character from the comics, no matter how obscure that uh, that that character was i just decided i wasn't going to create any new characters they were all going to be characters from those 80 years of history and i i kept to that pretty much except i had to invent one new character um i had to invent one new character for uh, for the tornado twins where i needed a, a a police officer from the 64th century and i could not find a police officer from the 64th century in the comics um and still meet my deadline. If, if I'd had more time, I'm sure I could have found one, but I just didn't have the time to, to look through every comic. Uh, so I created Citizen Heffa, and she is a quantum police officer in the 64th century. And uh, she's the only character who speaks, um, who speaks and has a name in across the six books who is not from the comics. Let's see. Let's look at another question here. Who was your favorite character to write besides Barry? Um, that one sort of 
caught me by surprise because I think it, it turned out that my favorite character to write besides Barry was Cisco, um, which I, I didn't expect because I, I liked the character, but I never felt any sort of um, connection to, to Cisco the way I felt connected to, to Flash or Superman um, or Supergirl or any of the members of the Legion who show up in the books. Um, but I just really had fun. I just decided early on that he was, he's, he's one of these guys, he's so smart that he's just cranky all the time because nobody can keep up with him. And so he's cranky all the time. And because I realized, you know, if, if you watch the show, they're always saying to him, okay, we need you to invent this. We need you to build this. We need this, we need this. And they always need it yesterday. Like they always need it right away. It's crazy. And, um, and I realized he would probably be cranky and he would be really tired because <laughs> they always need these things from him. He can never take a nap. He probably doesn't sleep very well. He's probably up all night working on this stuff. So I made him this total caffeine addict and he's just tired and cranky all the time. And I'm sure, and, and it's, it was just fun to write him because he's just complaining all the time about everything. And, uh, and on top of that, he, he's the guy who makes pop culture references. I mean, I'm the guy who makes pop culture references. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and I got to bounce him off all these different characters. Um, you know, uh, he, I got to write him with Barry, obviously. I got to have him go to Earth 2 and see Harrison Wells. I got to do that. I got to bounce him off Caitlin and Iris, obviously. Um, and then once Crossover Crisis hit, I got to bounce him off of Green Arrow and some of the members of Team Arrow, Team Arrow which was a lot of fun. Um, because they just don't put up with that mad science nonsense, but there's Cisco insisting. Um, and then I got to connect him with Mr. Terrific, which was a lot of fun. I got to have them lost in time for, for a book and a half, which was really cool. Um, and put them together because those are two geniuses who approach their level of genius from your very different perspectives. And it was a lot of fun to put them together and have them isolated from everybody else with only each other to, to talk to them. Uh, so I'm going to say Cisco was, was my favorite. Um, but I, I will say also that I really, really, really surprised myself. I love writing heat wave. I loved writing Mick Rory from the minute I put words in his mouth at the beginning of crossover crisis in the prologue to crossover crisis, when the, uh, the wave riders going through the time stream and suddenly shakes cause it's hit something. And, uh, and Mick says, did we hit another dinosaur? Because I'm not, I'm not hosing the guts off the windshield this time. And just fr from, from that minute, um, I just, I loved him. And I loved writing him. And I had so much fun. And he gets, I, I really, I think in this book, Mick Rory, Heat Wave, gets all the best lines and some of the best moments uh, in the entire book um, just by being him. And, and that was a lot of fun. Next question, let's see. What sort of non-comic research goes into a book like this with so much canonical material to work with? How do you choose what to use? How do you choose what to use? Yeah, um, that is a, a really, really good question. Um, you know, uh, non-comic research, you know, fortunately, when I was asked to write these books, I was already watching the shows. Um, so it wasn't you know, I didn't have to go back and rewatch. Now I had fallen behind on Arrow. Um, so I had to catch up on Arrow, but I was watching Supergirl. I was watching Flash. I was watching Legends. Um, I was caught up on everything. And so, so that wasn't difficult. And, and, you know, I have a pretty good memory for this sort of thing. It, that that <laughs> you ask what superpower I want, it's super speed. You ask what superpower I have, it is the ability to remember incredibly geeky things, whether I want to or not. Um, if you want to know every member of the Legion of Superheroes, their real name and their home planet, I'm your guy. Uh, I can do that. Yes, I was very popular in high school. Um, so, so I didn't really have to do a lot of research there. Now, there were times where I wanted to go back and make sure of something. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure I was getting references right, that if I mentioned a character and what they had done, that, uh, that, 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 that I was getting it right, you know. Uh, the good thing is that, again, I have a good memory for this sort of thing. And also that the, here's another behind the scenes <laughs> tidbit. When I write a book like this, the people at the CW have to read it and approve it um, because they own the characters they, and they own, they own the story. So I can't just write whatever I want 
and and then publish it, I have to let them see it first, and and they they get to tell me, yeah, that works, no, that doesn't work. And we had a terrific relationship, and they let me get away with things that, quite frankly, to this day, I am still stunned they let me get away with it. I cannot believe that I got to invent and then write the evil Bruce Wayne of Earth-27, um, who is very important to the series. Um, yeah, I, I can't believe some of the stuff that they let me do. But the great thing was that if, if I messed something up, then, uh, then you know, they would read it and they would say, oh, no, you know, uh, this character actually, you know, comes from this state, not that state, or, or whatever it is. Uh, the, the, the best thing I can think of, you know, I, I was asking how old some of the characters were. Um, and then the, the one thing was there was a part where um, I have Barry thinking about his parents. And, of course, his parents are both dead. His mom died when he was a kid. His father died. In, in season two, uh, when, when Zoom killed him. And so he's thinking about his, his parents and, you know, how they inspired him. And his father was a doctor and that inspired him this way. And his mother was a, and I was like, what was his mother? You know, she died when he was a kid and she's not on the show a lot. Like, like the father was, and I'm like, did we ever say what she was? And I, I went back and I tried to figure it out and I couldn't find anything. So finally I just asked the studio guys, what, what's, what was Barry's mom's job? What did she do? And they came back and they told me. So that was great. So um, I didn't have to, to do a huge, a, a ton of research. Um, but it was, it was good that that, that that was there. Another function of research for these books, and I know this is a crazy long answer, but another function of, of research for these books is that these books are, are a lot about science. And I wanted them to be about science. Like I said earlier, one of the things I love about the comics when I was a kid was the use of science, and I wanted to replicate that in the book. So I put as much real science as I could in there, which means I had to figure these things out. Uh, you know, at one point, uh, you know, in the comics, Barry does this thing all the time where somebody will be falling and he'll run under them and then he'll run around in a circle and whip up like a wind or something that slows their fall so that they don't get hurt. And I wanted to have him do that, but I wanted to know how that worked from a physics perspective. So I took, you know, half a day and sat down and tried to figure that out so I could explain it in the book. Um, there's, you know, these are books that actually have, you know, scientific formulas in them sometimes. Um, you know, there's a, a bit where uh, in, in one of the in one of the early books where where the villain is making all these people float away and they're going to drift off and leave the atmosphere and go into space. And Barry is trying to figure out how to save them. And he shouts out to Kid Flash, think of hydrocarbon. And Kid Flash is like, what? Hydrocarbon? And then he goes, oh, right, hydrocarbon. And he knows what a hydrocarbon molecule looks like and how it's all interconnected. And he uses that knowledge to connect himself to all these people uh, who are drifting away and then use his super speed to bring them back down. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. And, and But that took a lot of research um, to, to figure that sort of thing out. Let's look at the next question. Do you think the way these characters were portrayed on the CW show affected how you wrote them? Was it helpful or did it make it harder to write? Um, you know, I, like I said, the, the folks who own these characters and who own the show have to approve everything I do. So I definitely felt like I needed to write the characters so that they were uh, at least similar, recognizable uh, as the characters from the show. Uh, now, since this is a divergent timeline, since this is a whole different timeline, I realized that my characters were starting to go through uh, experiences and, and circumstances that were not on the show. They were doing things and, and, and living a life that was not like on the show. So the more books there were, the more I felt comfortable sort of using my own voice with some of these characters because they were living a different life than, than the ones on the show. And I didn't feel like I had to be identical um, to, to the show anymore. Uh, but that was just a function of the Divergent timeline. Let's see. Would you ever want to write graphic novels or comics? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I actually wrote a graphic novel years ago called Manga Man that Colleen Doran drew, and it looked beautiful. Colleen did such a gorgeous job with it. Um, I love comics. Comics are part of my blood. You can probably see the cabinet behind me full of comic book geek stuff. Um, yeah, I would, I would love to write uh, some comics, uh, some graphic novels. You know, it, it's a question of, of, of finding the right artist, finding the right project, finding the right publisher. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. 
let's see. You've written both YA and middle grade books. Do you have a preference for writing in either genre? Do you find them very different to write? Um, I don't know that I would say I have a preference. Um, they, they, you use different muscles. Um, you use different muscles uh, when, when you're writing for those two groups. You know, I, I feel like in YA, there's, there's nothing in YA that you can't do. Um, anything you'd see in an adult book, you can do it in a YA book. It just has to be from the point of view of a teenager. Um, and I've certainly written books, you know, the Iron Killers books that were just as gory as any adult thriller would be. Um, so you, you can do that. I think in middle grade, um, it, it's a younger audience. They're reading, they're reading deeply and independently for, for the first time, really. Um, and there are certain things that they're just not ready for. Um, and so you don't want to put those things in there. Um, so you have to think a little more about your reader when you're writing middle grade. Um, and even then there were times where my editor would say, are, are kids going to get this? Are kids going to understand this? Um, and you sort of go with your gut. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I think kids are going to get this, or, you know, I think they'll understand or they'll ask somebody or, or, you know, they'll look into it themselves. Um, so it, it is, it, it is a little different because you do have to think a little bit more about the audience when writing middle grade. Um, but, uh, but I, I really, I enjoy both. I, I don't know that I could pick or choose one over the other. Let's see, next question. I heard a quote recently from Stan Lee about superhero battles. He basically said it didn't matter who was stronger, it mattered who he needed to win for the story. Do you have the same philosophy when it comes to superhero clashes? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's true. Um, you know, uh, so, since Stanley was the topic, you know, the there were always arguments in the early days of Marvel, you know, who who's stronger, Hulk or Thor, or Hulk or the Thing. Um, at, at DC, the argument was who's faster, Flash or Superman? And the answer is it depends on who needs who who needs the win for the story. Um, you know, you can write the story in a number of different ways, and you can you can justify in a number of different ways, um, who wins, who loses. Um, you know, I could write a story where Flash wins. I could write a story where Superman wins. I think they would both be persuasive. I think they would both be interesting. And it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish with the story. Uh, the cool thing about, about superheroes is they're very, they're very malleable. They're very flexible. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the stretchy ones like plastic man and elongated man. Um, you can you can move you can move them around and you you can always have that moment where somebody gets lucky or somebody uses their power in a new or different way um, and and somebody in the chat just said I think as superhero fans we like to think there's a hierarchy of who would win in each battle I get that I get that um, it's very tempting it, it helps you sort of order the the universe but you know. Uh, even in the real world, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, in, in 1980, the, the U.S. Olympic hockey team beat the Russians and nobody in the world thought that was going to happen, but it did. They had a really good day and the Russians had a really bad day. And so sometimes that happens. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, I personally think Flash should be able to beat Superman 99 times out of 100, but that hundredth time, something happens, something happens. And if the story needs it, Superman beats the Flash, and and I, I think that's really cool. I think that's that's part of the fun is that you think you know how the story is going to go, but maybe it doesn't go that way. Maybe it goes a different way. Uh, are there any books or comics specifically that had a lasting impact on you or your writing? Any recent great reads? Um, oh boy, uh, you know books or comics that had a lasting impact on me. Yeah, sure. Uh, th there's a book called Replay by a gentleman named Ken Grimwood uh, that I read when I was much, much younger. It's a time travel book that has a terrific twist. Um, and uh, it really had an impact on me as a kid. Um, that's one. Some of the books by uh, Joe Haldeman, a terrific science fiction writer. Uh, he, he 
was just wonderful. And he really influenced the way I think. Uh, as far as comics go, The Legion of Superheroes by Paul Levitz, um, when I was a kid, was, was just a great, great, great series of comics that just really expanded what I thought you could do in superhero comics. Um, and also Alan Moore's uh, Swamp Thing comics did the same thing. Uh, recent great reads. Um, now I, I would have to go clicking through my little uh, book spreadsheet to, to give you one, to give you some, because my, my memory is terrible when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, but right now I'm reading a book called The Power. I cannot remember the name of the author, but it's about a world in which women have developed the ability to sort of like shoot lightning out of their hands. Um, girls and women can do this and men can't. And it's about how the world changes when suddenly every woman on the planet has a superpower. Uh, and that's, that's really cool. I haven't finished it yet. I'm, I'm about halfway through. Um, but that, that's a really cool premise. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm enjoying that quite a bit. Let's see. Um, speaking of, uh, ah, thank you. The folks of Mysterious Galaxy are there for us. It is The Power by Naomi Alderman. There we go. <laughs> so go ahead. Go buy that. There, if you're in the chat, there's a link to it. You can buy it at Mysterious Galaxy. So go do that. Um, speaking of who do you think would win, the Avengers or the Justice League? Um, it, it, look, look, I, I, I love the Avengers. I love the movies. I, I wrote the origin of Thanos for the movies, actually, uh, the, the novel Thanos. Um, but I'm a DC kid. That stuff's part of my DNA, the Justice League. The, the, the just, I mean, yeah. I mean, especially the classic league where you got Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash. I mean, right there, just those four. I mean, the, the, the power level is crazy. Um, can you talk about the cover design for these Flash books? Yeah, gosh, I, I, I wish I could show you guys um, all the covers. I, I had a slide in my presentation, which was all six covers together. Um, but um, yeah, the covers are really cool. And actually, you know, with this one, if you look at it at first, I love this. Uh, you think, oh, there's there's seven there's seven uh, heroes on that cover, but no, there's an eight right there. That little tiny right there, that's the atom. That makes me so happy. <laughs> they they had the cover done, and I said, guys, can we put the atom on the cover? And they said, there's not enough room. And I said, no, make them tiny, make them really, really, really tiny. And they did it, and I was it made me so happy that he's right there. Um, so yeah, I love these covers. Uh, they are all wonderful and so cool. Um, and I, I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, you know, when, when I agreed to do these books and they said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll show you the cover. I thought, oh, you know, it, 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 it's a, it's a licensed book. That's what they're called when you, you do something, you know, based on a, another property, it's a licensed book. And, um, and I'm like, I, I, I figured that there would just be a, um, what do you call it? A thing with, uh, you know, where they would just like take a picture of, of, the characters on set one day and they would just use that for the cover and it would just be a picture of of, of the actors because uh, that's what you see a lot of times with with licensed books and i thought okay that'll be fine it won't be anything special but that'll be nice and then they got these gorgeous these beautiful covers i mean you know even if you don't read the books buy them for the covers they're so beautiful um and uh they're just really great and i was so happy and, and not only are the covers nice so the, the covers are really nice, but you know, I'm going to, I had nothing to do with this, so I can brag about this a little bit, but they just, they did a really beautiful job inside the books too. Um, you know, where it's, it's not just, I mean, that's just really nice. You don't see that on a lot of books where, you know, where they do that sort of thing. Um, you know, I got to do my little, my little roll call, which is cool. Um, and then you know, the prologues have their own special designs and um, the chapter, the chapter heads are just great. That lightning effect. And then there's the, the lightning bolts coming down the side, pointing to the page numbers. It's just really cool. They're, they're just really, really beautiful books and, and much, much more beautiful than, than I was anticipating or, or even dreaming of. And, and I was really pleased to, to see them. Um, it looks like one more question. <laughs> this is a great question to uh, wrap up on, unless anybody has any other ones. But uh, can you talk about what's next for you slash anything new and exciting that you're working on? Um, what is next for me? 
Look at that. Just had it right here. In September is this book, Time Will Tell, which is a young adult novel. It's a, it's a thriller about uh, some kids who dig up a time capsule that their parents buried back in 1986. And uh, when they open it up, <coughs> excuse me, they find evidence of murder inside. And now they're trying to figure out what did their parents do <clears throat> back in 1986 that led to this. So, <coughs> sorry, once again, <laughs> uh, I've been talking too much. My throat's dry. But, uh, but that, that, was, that was, you know, a very, <clears throat> very different sort of book to write and uh, uh, used very different muscles than the Flash books. But I had a good time writing it. And uh, it will be out in September, and I hope uh, people will enjoy it. It's very different from this, obviously, uh, but the same guy. And, uh, you know, an in, in, in interesting uh, thing to, to play with. So that's that's what's coming out next. And other than that, I'm working on a couple things that I can't really talk about yet. But that's it. And here we are. <laughs> yeah, wow. Always such a tease when someone's like, I've got some things that I can't talk yeah, about. I, you know, it's just too soon. <laughs> just premature. Exactly. But yeah, time will tell. That sounds incredible. Someone in the chat was also like, that's a great premise. I agree. Oh, you got a pre-order link up. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Yeah, pre-order. Pre-order pre Mary's book. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And thank you for having you me. You know, chatting about The Flash and all things superheroes. Had a great time. Um, as a reminder, thank you everyone for watching tonight and joining us. Thank you, Barry, for coming and enthusing about all things superheroes. Uh, just a final reminder, you guys can buy this last book or all of Barry's Flash books if you haven't already by clicking that buy book and signed book plates button below our video. It's in green. And yes, you can get a signed and personalized book plate, which is super awesome. And thank you, Barry, for doing that for us. Of course. Yeah. Um, and with that, Thank you guys for coming. Have a great night, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks for the Bye. questions, everybody. <laughs>